Turn in your Bibles, if you will, tonight to the ninth chapter of the book of Acts. Acts chapter number 9. One verse of Scripture tonight in verse number 13 of Acts chapter number 9. Acts chapter number 9 and verse number 13. Thank you for being here tonight. Appreciate you being in the Lord's house on Wednesday evening. Acts chapter 9, verse number 13. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. Lord, thank you tonight that we can gather together in this midweek service. I pray you'll help us and speak to us and uh, give us something to strengthen us for the journey. And thank you again for each one present this evening. Help us this evening, Lord, during these few moments together to glean some wonderful truths from your word. And we'll thank you for it. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you. You may, you may be seated. I've been talking to us for several uh, Wednesday nights, about three months now, on the life of the Apostle Paul. And in this series, I've been giving us a one-word structure, title, that kind of defines his life before he met the Christ. And tonight, instead of going down that list, I'm just going to start with the word this evening to speed things along and talk to you about this verse of Scripture, and then I'll be talking to us about some other passages of Scripture, Lord willing, before we close the service. I want you to note with me, in this verse, a word and a phrase that gives us the word that I want to use at the beginning of the service tonight. And it is the word abounding. I've been using these one word structures, titles, to identify and characterize the life of Saul while he was living out in sin, unsaved, undone, without Christ as his Savior. And tonight, in this verse, and we'll look at another word before we close tonight, but in this word, I use the word abounding. And the reason I use that word is, first of all, because in verse number 13, then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by, and here's the first word. I use abounding here because he said, I have heard by many. Now, had you been living in this era and walked down the streets of Jerusalem especially, you would, you would come upon people, you would meet people that in, uh, there's no doubt they would be talking about the severity of the works of Saul of Tarsus against the church of Jesus Christ. I guarantee you, had you been living not only in the city of Jerusalem, but had you been living in the cities in and around Jerusalem, and of course, as we've studied all the way to Damascus, 150 miles away, probably about as far as you would want to travel. If you struck up a conversation with someone, in all probability, the name of Saul of Tarsus would come up. And there's no doubt they would talk about something like this. Have you heard about that terror named Saul? Have you heard about how he's killing those Christians? Have you heard about how he's torturing those Christians? Have you heard about the numbers of people he has placed in prison? There's no doubt that would become the topic of conversation. I, I, I'm convinced that as today in our society, the subject of conversation is President Trump. You turn the news channels on, that's the topic of conversation. I'm sure in that day, had they had a news media like we have today, the headlines would have had Saul of Tarsus named there. 
because his abounding presence was affecting the city and the countryside by the hundreds and all in all totality the thousands of people who were called upon to suffer and to give their lives for the cause of Christ because he was the lead man. He was the head man trying to stamp out Christianity. Now you have that in this chapter in a couple of other places. Look with me please in verse number 21 of Acts chapter number 9. But all that heard him were amazed. And they said... Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest? Notice what they said at the beginning. Is not this he that destroyed them which call on his, this name in Jerusalem. Look back at our text, verse, thir verse 13. I have heard by many. Forward a little, diff a little farther in verse 26. You have it again. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. Now, wait a minute. At this point, Saul is saved. He's been tamed. His sins are forgiven. He's a child of God. Uh, his, he's justified. He's, uh, he's now beginning to try to build what he has previously destroyed. He's tried to destroy Christianity. Now he's in the process of trying to lay a foundation to build up that name again. But notice when they want to introduce him to the disciples, verse 26, when they came to Jerusalem, uh, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. I guess the way you could kind of compare that would be like if you had lived in the days of Al Capone. Al Capone was the gangster. Uh, his name was known in the ghettos and in the cities, and he was responsible for killing numbers of people. And if the word, after many years, had gotten out on the street, this guy, he's gotten saved. His life has changed. There'd be a lot of people that would say, well, I'll take your word for it. I don't want to be around him. Saul got saved. The disciples at Jerusalem are afraid of him. The people in the city are afraid of him. The people on the countryside are afraid of him. And the reason they are is because they are afraid that maybe just maybe this is something that's being said, but he's not really changed. This is just an avenue to reach us so that he can imprison us, so he can take our lives, so he can prosecute and persecute us for our faith. So here is this word abounding in this word in verse number 13, I have heard by many. But there's a second phrase now. Here, I want you to look at. I've got this highlighted in my Bible. I don't want to miss it as I read it. I've got the word many in my Bible highlighted. Uh, you might want to draw a line under it, put it in parentheses or circle it because it adds to the meaning of the life of Saul. But the second phrase here, I want you to note that uh, I, I'm speaking to us about in the word abounding tonight is that not only did he abound in the lives of many, but look at the phrase, how much evil. The evil that he did abounded. Notice what it says. Many, many abounding in the lives of many. Many abounding in how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. Now I want you to notice what he was abounding in. He was not abounding in righteousness as he was known to be doing later on. Here's the sinner of sinners. He called himself in the writing of Timothy. He called himself the chiefest of sinners. Here is this man abounding, not in good, not in decency, but notice what he's abounding in. The Bible says that he hath abounded in evil. 
He was known as Mr. Evil. He was known as Mr. Corruption. He was known as the anti-Jesus establishment. He is known as Mr. Persecutor. And so he is abounding in these things. Now, the Apostle Paul himself acknowledged after he got saved that he abounded in these things. You have your Bibles? I want you to turn with me. It's the same book of the Bible, the book of Acts, but I want you to see this for yourselves this evening. His testimony was, after he got saved, that he abounded in many things that was wrong. He abounded in evil. Look with me, please, in the 26th chapter of the book of Acts as he continues to give his testimony. Now he's changed, he's, he's reminding the people to whom he's addressing this issue of his past life. Look in Acts chapter number 26, if you will please, and notice with me in verse number 10. This is his personal testimony after he got saved. Uh, let me ask you tonight, now that you're saved, aren't you glad that you can talk about in your own personal life, the way it used to be versus the way it is now. I mean, you, you, might have been as, you might have been as mean as a circle saw. I mean, it might be that when people pointed at you, uh, they, they did so with disdain because they knew you before you got saved. But you know the thing that cancels out your past is living right in the present. And you can put people to shame that are, that are still out there having never been saved when they want to say something about your past, but you can say, that's the person I used to be, but in the words of the Bible, but now. But now, ye who are in Christ, as Paul said to the church of Ephesus. Here Paul is talking about the way it was, but now he's talking about the way it is. Well, look at Acts twenty six ten. Which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison. Having received authority from the chief priest. And when they were put to death. I gave my voice against them. Now he's setting the stage here. To tell them about what's different. What's changed in his life. He is laying the foundation. And in that foundation. In his testimony. He is talking about how he lived for Satan, how he lived a life of sin and persecution to the church of Jesus Christ. But look at the next verse. He continues, Acts 26, 11. And I punished them oft in every synagogue. Now, I want you to watch that phrase. I'm coming back to this in just a moment. I'm going to enlarge on this. Notice where he punished them. The Bible said he punished them off. In every synagogue, in the place where they met to worship. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. In other words, he threatened them. And he said something like this. You either deny this Christ, deny him, or I will imprison you, or I will scourge you, I will beat you. You blaspheme that name, I'll let you go. He compelled people to do that. I remember where I came from years ago. There was a very wicked man in the community. He would take his small son down to a grocery store. <clears throat> and he would take his son. And you know how all the farmers, years ago, they, would, they had a meeting place down, down to the grocery store. And they'd sit around and talk. Talk about their crops, talk about politics. Some get around and talk about religion. He would take his young boy. And he would set him up on a table there in the grocery store. And he'd say, all right, son, I want you to say this word. And he'd give him a cuss word. He would literally teach his son how to curse in front of those men. <clears throat> he made a big issue. Out, and they'd, ha, ha. They thought it was big stuff. That this man was teaching his son how to curse there in the grocery store. Thought that was big stuff. Well, Saul thought it was big stuff. When he could get people to blaspheme the name that he didn't even believe in existed. And that's what he's saying here in Acts 26, 11. He said he compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them unto strange cities. 
abounding in sin, abounding in the lives of many, abounding in our text verse in evil. He was having to jump up to touch bottom because he had stooped to such a low ebb of causing his evil and his sin to abound in the lives of so many people. I want to give you a second word tonight, and we'll not get any farther than this. I'm going to enlarge on this. But the second word that I want to drop in your heart tonight is the word punishment. Punishment or punishing. And to find this word, I want you to turn back just a few chapters to the 22nd chapter of the book of Acts. We find this word. Acts chapter 22. And notice with me please in verse number 5. The Bible says, as also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all of the estate of the elders, from whom also I received letters unto the brethren, I went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem far to be, here's the word. This is my second word, not only word abounding, but tonight the next word is this word punishment or punished. Turn back to Acts chapter 26. We find this word again. Acts chapter 26 in verse number 11. It's right at the beginning of verse number 11. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Now, I want you to notice, especially in 2611, I want to, I want to get in on this for just a minute. Sometimes we, we miss these things. I say this quite often. We read the Bible, but we, we don't, sometimes we don't pay attention as we should. We miss something. I want you to notice in 2611, he said, I punished them oft in every synagogue. I don't ask you to turn, but let me give you two other passages of Scripture that our Lord quoted from the Gospel of Matthew. In Matthew chapter 10, in verse number 17, Jesus said, But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will, don't you hear this phrase, they will scourge you in their synagogues. Now here in Acts 26, 11, and I punish them oft in every synagogue. Now there's a reason for that. Jesus said they will punish you, persecute you in the synagogue. Jesus again in Matthew 23, 34 said this. Wherefore, behold, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them uh, you shall Here's the phrase, scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. Now, Paul here is speaking about scourging in the synagogues. Now, later on in his life, he talked about doing this. He talked about what he did to other people. And it, re, and it reversed on him, and he himself was scourged in the synagogues. Now, once you get a hold of this, it's important that we understand this. He scourged people in the synagogues, in the place of worship. Now, first of all, let me define a couple of things for us. What is the difference between a synagogue and for instance, the temple. You'll find the word synagogue mentioned several times in the book of Acts. Because here's what the apostle Paul did. When Paul went into a town to preach the gospel, the first place he went, if they had a synagogue, was there to preach the gospel. He believed the synagogue to be the most productive place to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In reality, a synagogue was just a mini, mini version of the temple, but it was not a place where they offered up sacrifices. They did that at the temple. The synagogue was a place 
where they could meet and they went through certain procedures in worship. Uh, somebody would get up and was responsible for reading the Old Testament scriptures. And then somebody, sometimes it would be a visiting preacher, would get up and would expound that passage of scripture. It was a local synagogue, and they, those synagogues were scattered out through Asia Minor. If there was a city and they could get 50 people together that wanted a place of worship, and they could afford it, they would put up this building called a synagogue, and it would become a house of worship in the locality near them. Therefore, they would not have to travel, many of them, great distances to Jerusalem to get to the temple unless it was on the great high day, the holy day, uh, the day when they celebrated the Passover and slaying of the animals and etc., and the high priest and all of that uh, day of atonement down at Jerusalem. In between, and you'll find this again, I don't mean to be repetitious, but as you read the book of uh, Acts, you'll find that Paul, the first place he would go when he went into a town was the synagogue. He knew that there would be Jews there worshiping. And so what he wanted to do, he wanted to go there and present the gospel to the Jewish people to try to teach them that the one that they are looking for, their Messiah, has already come. And he would be able to give his testimony as a Jew that I used to blaspheme and profane that holy and high name. But he'd be able to stand up and say, but I met him one day. I know he's alive. I've talked to him. I've fellowshiped with him. He's changed my life. I want you to know the one you're looking for has already come. Let me take you back to my Damascus Road experience. Let me share with you what's happened to me. My life has been transformed. I've been changed. I've been made a new creature simply because I have met the master, the Jewish Messiah. So he would go in the temple. And in the temple, he would preach the Lord Jesus. Now, he went to the temple before he got saved. But he didn't go there to preach. He went there to persecute. He knew that if he could get to the temple, that there would be some people there who were Christians. And he would single those people out. And he would imprison them or scourge them. Or whatever. But here's the thing I want you to understand. This, uh, this scourging, uh, you, can, you find this back, for instance, in the book of Deuteronomy. I think it's about the fifth chapter. That was a Jewish means of persecution against those who opposed the law, against those who opposed Moses. So one of the means of going into a temple and finding somebody preaching the name Jesus would be right there in that temple according to Jewish history and Jewish tradition they would take that individual and they would scourge him right there in the temple in front of everybody because they are saying you're breaking the law you are preaching a Messiah who does not exist now that's the reason you find here in our text verse uh, in Acts 26, 11, I punished them off in every synagogue. What was the means of punishment? Well, they would scourge them. They would whip them there in the synagogue. And then all of a sudden, the apostle Paul's going in the same place now that he's saved, and he is getting scourged. Now, I want you to see this. I'm going to enlarge on it for just a minute. Turn back in your Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians, or forward in your Bible, to the book of 2 Corinthians, and I want you to notice with me, first of all, the sixth chapter. We're going to be looking at another passage, but first of all, 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. And notice with me, please, in verse number 5. He is talking about his life. He's talking about what he has endured now that he's saved. Notice what he says, in stripes. Now those stripes, in all probability, are stripes that he is receiving in the temple. Because he went into the temple to preach the gospel. And it was <coughs> diametrically opposed <coughs> to what they believed in the temple. So what did they do? 
they, they scourged them on the spot. That was their means. Uh, uh, that would be like somebody coming in our church. And they say, you talk about this Jesus. Uh, we're not sure we believe in him. Well, the punishment would have been right then. They'd catch the guy and scourge him. That's the way they did it. But look at look with me, please, in uh, 2 Corinthians again, the 11th chapter, and he goes into great detail about uh, this thing of scourging and this thing of lashing and whipping. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11, and notice with me, please, in, uh, let's begin in verse number 23. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23, he's, he's giving his history now. He's saved. He's the apostle to the Gentiles. But look at 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. Watch this. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, off. Verse 24. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Now you can be relatively safe if you make notes in your Bible, to write right beside of that, based on what we've learned tonight, temple, or, or uh, 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 not temple, but uh, uh, synagogue suffering, because that's probably where it took place at. Now, I want you to notice what he says. This is important. He said, of the Jews five times. Why would the Jews be lashing him? Because he's preaching the Messiah. They don't believe Jesus has come. Well, where's this taking place? There's no doubt. It's taking place in these different places. He's preaching in these different synagogues because he's preaching Jesus. And so it's their custom if somebody comes in here and they're preaching another Savior, another God, another Christ, they punish them on the spot. So here in verse 24, of the Jews five times received of 40 stripes, save one. Now, why would he use that phrase, 40 stripes, save one? Here's the reason. The law was strict on both sides of the spectrum. A man would be, would be beaten with 40 stripes for preaching something different than they said Moses' law taught. However, if they laid the lash on him 41 times, if somebody miscounted, and they laid the lash on him 41 times, then the person who's laying the lash on the body will also receive the same treatment. Now, that's the reason he said five times, five times 40 stripes save one. What's happening? They wanted to make sure that the person that's doing the lashing don't overstep his boundaries and do it 41 times. Because the person doing the lashing don't want to go through the same thing he's imposing. So as a means of measurement to save their own hide, somebody would help him count. And when he got to 39, he would stop. Now they're saying you get 40 stripes. But he said, I don't want to take a chance on miscounting because if I get 41 and I miscount it, they're going to do the same thing to me that I did to him. So when Paul said of the Jews received I, watch this in the verse, of the Jews five times received I 40 stripes, save one, it means, and I want you to think about this, I want you to try to put yourself in Paul's place, what he is now telling us that he has received 195 lashes for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to put yourself in this position. I don't want you to think about this just a minute. Again, when you read the book of Acts, Paul's going into the synagogue. He's preaching Jesus. What if you was in his shoes? What if you knew when you went into the next city, you could reach a group of Jews and preach to them about Jesus in the synagogue? But you know before you get in there and preach Jesus, you're going to receive a minimum of 39 lashes for doing so. Do you think he would go? 
Do you think you might give it a second thought? <clears throat> Do you think you might try to witness out in the streets? Do you think you might try to meet them somewhere else in the marketplace or somewhere else rather than going into the synagogue? I don't think Paul gave it a second thought. He had a burden for the Jewish people. He said in Romans 9 and in Romans 10, my Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He wanted his people saved. And although he knows that if he goes in that synagogue and opens up the scriptures and begins to interpret to them who the Messiah is and that he's already come, they're going to grab him, they're going to hold him, they're going to tie him around a pole, and they're going to take a lash, and they're going to lay that lash on his body for 39 stripes. He knows that. Could you imagine being lashed 39 times, a total that he gives us here, if you add it all up, 195 stripes, all total, you're going to have placed on your body for just telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ. By him getting that many stripes in the house of God, I believe it sends a signal to us that more than anything else, even at the punishment of his own body, he felt the weight of giving out the gospel more abundantly and more fluently than even taking his own personal being into consideration. He was willing to, be, to suffer. He was willing to be whipped. <clears throat> he was willing for them to open up the skin on his body just to have the privilege and the opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus. Doesn't that put us to shame today? When we have the opportunity to hand out a track, we have the opportunity to witness to somebody and not get hurt and not be harmed for doing so. Here's a man willing to take a beating to give out the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I think that's the reason in the book of Galatians, he opened, up his, he opened up his coat one day, and here's what he said. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus carried the marks of the slaughter in his body, but so did the Apostle Paul. And then we're told that he was beaten with rods. Now, I don't know where all of that took place. I'm convinced that this lashing, this scourging took place in the, in, in the synagogue. But he also said he was beaten with rods. Now the word that's used there for a rod was a stiff instrument that would not flex. Could you imagine taking something like one of these microphone stands, one of these uh, pieces of uh, steel right here that would not flex? Well, if you don't think I got it, look at here. Could you imagine taking one of these right here and the end being off of it and taking that and laying it across somebody's back? He was beaten with rods. You know something? It was only a miracle that he lived as long as he did with the persecution he went through. Think about it. He persecuted the church unmercifully. But when he got saved, he realized what he'd done. He was so sorry that he'd done it. He was so ashamed of the fact he placed himself now in the position to receive what he's been giving out all of this time. Because he said the things that I had before I met the Savior in the book of Philippians are no more than table scraps. He says absolutely nothing. Things that ought to be in the slop bucket. The things that I held in esteem and the things that I held so high. He said is absolutely nothing that I might win Christ. I might know more about the suffering of his crucifixion and I might no more about the power of his resurrection. He said, flowing through my body. He was in love with Jesus uh, and his love grew until his head was taken off of his shoulders and he was willing to suffer because he loved his Savior. God help us to love Jesus the way he did. Now in Acts chapter 26, if you'll turn back there, We'll be closing here shortly. I want you to see something in Acts chapter number 26. In Acts chapter number 26, 
He's before Agrippa given his testimony. And I want to call your attention to verse 16. <clears throat> Acts chapter 26, verse number 16. But rise and stand upon thy feet. Now he's giving his testimony before Agrippa. This is what Jesus said to him. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen and of the things in the which I will appear unto thee. I want you to notice in verse number 16, I'm going to stay here for just a few moments and then we'll be on our way. He is repeating the commission that Christ gave to him. And there's one thing I want to call to your attention tonight. He said, I, he, he, Jesus appeared unto him for this purpose. Here, here it is. Here's the reason he's saying he saved me. To make thee a minister and a witness. If there has ever been in the history of Christianity, a witness for the cause of Jesus Christ, it was Saul of Tarsus. I want to follow that line of thought for just a minute. And in order to do so, I want you to turn back with me to the ninth chapter that records his conversion. And I want us to notice something about his witnessing. This is vitally important. Because we are also called to be witnesses. In Acts chapter 1, he said, ye shall be witnesses unto me. But look with me, please. In Acts chapter number 9, here we have the recorded history of his conversion. And I want you to notice Acts chapter 9. And let's begin reading in verse number 18. Now here's the story. He's met the Lord. He's blinded. He's not able to see. God sends Ananias down there. In verse number 18, 17, Ananias calls on him. And the Bible said in verse 18, immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales. And he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Now remember, this is just after his conversion. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. He hadn't had anything to eat. His appetite's been gone. He's living. He's groping in darkness now for two or three days. Then was Saul certain days with his disciples, which were at Damascus. Now watch verse 20. And straightway, he preached Christ, here's that phrase, in the synagogue, that he is the Son of God. Will you think about that for just a minute? He's gone into the very place where he has spent much time persecuting and lacerating Christians. When he got saved in Acts chapter 26, the Lord said, he's going to be a witness unto me. When he got saved, one of the first things he did was he immediately started witnessing. Look at verse 20. Straightway, he preached Christ in the synagogue that he is the Son of God. Paul got saved, but he didn't wait until he took a soul winning course. Paul got saved. He didn't wait until he had four years of a school of higher learning. He didn't wait until he went off somewhere uh, to, uh, to get educated, to go to a college and go off somewhere to a seminary, in many instances a cemetery, and try to increase his knowledge of the scriptures. When he got saved, immediately he became a witness. Or oh, to times down through the years of ministry, I've heard people say to me, I'm trying to figure out what God's will is for my life. Well, I can tell you one thing God's will is for all of us, that we become witnesses. The Great Commission is found five times explicitly in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, in the first chapter of the book of Acts. And you shall be witnesses unto me. The word witness is the same word we get our word martyr from. It means somebody that witnesses even to the giving of their life if necessary. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul did. Immediately when he got saved, he became a witness. But let's follow that through the book of Acts for just a moment. 
Look with me, please, in Acts chapter number 9. And notice verse 29. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians. But they went about to slay him. Where's he at? Look at verse 28. He was with them coming in and going out of Jerusalem. But look at verse 30. Not only did he immediately begin to witness, but in verse number 30, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. What's he doing? He's witnessing. He's telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants people to understand. Look at 28 again. He's coming in out of Jerusalem. And he's, spe he's speaking in the name of the Lord. And everywhere they're taking him now, he's witnessing. But I want you to notice this especially. He goes right back to the place where they crucified Christ. He goes right into the city where he's known as the great persecutor of the church. He goes right there where the apostles have settled down instead of going out and carrying the great commission. He's right in their presence and he's preaching in the very city where he was killing those who served the Lord Jesus Christ. He immediately started and he immediately started in the same city where it all happened. You know, if there's some people around you or some people you know that used to know you the way you used to be, it would be a great testimony to go back to them and say, I just want to say something to you. You remember how I was? Let me tell you what's happened to me now. That's what Saul did. He went back, right back in the center of religion, right back in Jerusalem. And he started preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you two or three more and we'll be going. I want you to turn to the 13th chapter of the book of Acts, and notice verse number 5. Acts 13, 5. Here they have set up, been set apart by the Holy Spirit to go on missionary endeavor. And notice with me, please, in the book of Acts, chapter 13, and verse number 5. And when they were at Salamis, uh, uh, Salamis uh, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also had John to their minister. Notice now what he's doing. Not only did he start preaching immediately when he got saved, not only did he preach in Jerusalem, but now he's traveling around to those places where he used to arrest those Christians were in the synagogues. What's he doing now? He's going in the synagogues where he used to arrest people. He's going in the synagogues uh, and preaching the Jesus uh, that he used to try to destroy. This man's had a transformation take place in his life. Not only that, but notice with me, please, in uh, Acts chapter 16. I'm hurrying to a close, but notice where he's witnessing. In Acts chapter number 16 and verse number 13, and on the Sabbath we went out of the city by the riverside where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and we spake unto the women which resorted thither. Now, why did he go out by the riverside? Because this city didn't have a synagogue. So he finds there's a little meeting going on and he makes his way down there and uh, the, he, he preaches to Lydia and the next thing you know, <clears throat> her heart is opened up and she receives the Lord. They invite, her, invite him into their home uh, because they've been transformed by the message of grace. So he preaches immediately when he gets saved. He preaches in Jerusalem. Uh, he preaches in the synagogue and now the city don't have a synagogue where he's at. So he goes down by the riverside and he's witnessing to them down there by the riverside. He wants everybody to know in the 16th chapter of the book of Acts, he's in prison with Paul and Silas and along about midnight, they sing and pray. You know the story. God shook the prison. The bars uh, uh, swung open uh, and the Philippian jailer sprang in and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And he's able to witness to the Philippian jailer and said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And that night they had a household salvation. If it's in prison now, he's witnessing. If it's in Jerusalem, if it's in the synagogue, if it's a day or two after he got saved, everywhere he's going. Look at chapter 17 of the book of Acts and notice verse number 17. The Bible says, therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons, watch this, and in the market daily with them that met with him. What's he doing? He's going in the synagogues. Where else is he going? He's going down to the marketplace. He went over at Walmart's. 
He went over to Sam's Club. He went down to Food Line. He went to the mall. What's he doing? He's telling everybody, everywhere he goes, about Jesus. He's a witness. That's what he said the Lord called him to do. I read that just a few minutes ago. He said, you're going to be my witness. Look at chapter 20, verse 20. Now, if you want to be a member of a church that's got 20-20 vision, right here's the key. Look at Acts chapter 20, and notice with me, please, verse number 20. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you, I have taught you publicly, watch this, and from house to house. What's he doing? He's doing exactly what every church ought to do, what we try to do. He's going from house to house. Acts 20, 20 is 20, 20 vision. You take the message, you take it to immediately when you get saved. Uh, you take it into Jerusalem. You take it into the synagogue. Uh, you take it in the marketplace. You take it down by the riverside, uh, wherever you can go. And then you go from house to house and you witness unto them. You know why he did it? His life was transformed. You know why he did it? He fell in love with Jesus. You know why he did it? He wanted the world to know the Jesus that he knew because Jesus had transformed his life and he could not keep it silent. Now, look back at 26 Acts, Acts 26. Let me give you this, and we'll head out. Look at Acts 26, 16. I want to say something to you about witnessing. Let me tell you what, let me give you, and we're going. I know I said that a minute ago. We will. Well, let me tell you something. Let me give you the definition of a witness. Now, this is deep. You're going to have to write this down. It's going to be deep stuff. A witness is someone who witnesses. You say, preacher, that's really deep stuff. Well, it ought to be. Because look at verse 16 of Acts 26. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of those things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. Look at verse 22. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day witnessing both to the small and great. A witness is someone that witnesses. Who do they witness to? Look what he said. To the small and to the great. You know what that means? You witness to the doctor. You witness to the lawyer. You witness to the person that picks up the garbage. Small and great. That can be the knowns and it can be the unknowns. But God don't look at us according to our titles. God looks at us according to the condition of our hearts. A witness is somebody that witnesses. And he witnessed to the small and to the great. But look at verse 22 again. A witness is someone who never stops witnessing. A witness witnesses, but he never stops witnessing. Look at, uh, look at this. Having therefore obtained the help of God, look at this. I continue unto this day. He hadn't stopped. There's multitudes of people that started out, but they stopped. They never continued to witness. Hey, every day we ought to have a witness. Every day. A witness never stops witnessing. I want you to watch this lastly in verse 22. A witness has the help of God as they witness. Look at this. Having therefore obtained the help of God. Do you see that? If you want somebody to partner with you in witnessing, you just try to witness. And I guarantee you, if you'll ask the Lord to help you, he'll show up and help you. He'll give you help. He'll give you boldness to do it. You say, I'm afraid of what people are going to say. You better be more afraid of what God's going to say if we don't do it. Because we've all been commissioned to do it. We've all been commissioned to do it. And we need to give out a witness. I don't say this bragging. I say this bragging on Jesus. I don't want you to take this wrong. I don't want any glory. 
I don't want it coming to me. I want it to go to the Savior. I had a politician to come by my office today. He's running for Secretary of State. He's a Christian politician. He's an ex-businessman, and he's, I think he's rolling in the dough. He said, I wanted to come by and see you. He said, I've heard about you all over the state of North Carolina. And he said, I want your help. You know what I'm glad of? I'm glad that across the state of North Carolina, there's people that know that there's a church in Winston-Salem that's not afraid to get out there on the front line and do what God's called us to do. Thank God that we can be an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ. Get you some tracks when you walk out of this building tonight. When you see somebody, stick it under their nose. And say, I want you to read this. This will help you. This has got something, tell it, tell it this way, and they'll probably read. This has got something in here for you that's free. People go after free stuff. And just tell them, just reach in there and pull out that track and say, I want you to read this right here. This right here will help you. When nothing else will work, thank God this will work. Amen. I'm glad somebody told me. Somebody has rightly said that a Christian is somebody that's found where the bread's at and they're telling everybody else where they can find it. Yep, let's stand with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. You know, it might be good for some of you tonight to get around the altar and say, Lord, help me to be a witness. Or Lord, help me to increase my witnessing. Lord, help me to give out a track to somebody this week. Help me to stop and tell somebody this week about Jesus. That's what Christians do. That's what Paul did. That's what the Lord told him to do when he saved him. He said, you're going to be my witness. If you need to come tonight, get around the altar, do it. Ask God to help you to be a witness. Give you boldness to witness. Give you the strength to witness. Father, I want to thank you tonight. You have given us here the great truth of a great man who became great in your sight because he met you one day and you changed his life. And he wanted other people to know about you. Help us to want other people to know about you also. And help us to be willing to tell other people about you. In Jesus' name. We're singing. If you need to come tonight, others, would you come? Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. story years ago I heard a man tell this story a man and his wife was in the lobby of a motel one night very rich knew nothing about Christ and a preacher went up to his wife he had gone somewhere else on the premise and the preacher happened to see this lady standing over there and he went up to her I think it was Moody went up to her and started witnessing to her about the Lord and she was receptive and the husband came up and he was irritated, aggravated because this man was talking to his wife about the Lord. And the preacher could tell that the man was irritated so he quickly closed the conversation and he left. And that man said to his wife, who was that? He said, well, it was a preacher. He, he, was, he was talking to me about in his words, he said that, that I needed to be saved. And her husband said to her, why didn't you tell him to mind his own business? And she said, 
I think he was. He was minding his own business. He was doing what God had called him to do.